Hello and welcome back to the Air Armoury, I'm JRH and today I'm looking at the original Model 50. The original Model 50. I think you've only seen this in one video so far, and that was the Firebird Exploding Targets, but it also featured in the opening titles of the Air Armoury. Now, I first just wanted to give you a bit of background information about the original company and name. There's maybe not everyone's heard of original, but a company no doubt you will have all heard of is Diana, and this is essentially a Diana rifle. Uh, Diana guns, made by the Meyer and Grammelschbacher Dianawerk company in Germany, have been in production since uh, late 19th to early 20th century. However, during the Second World War, the Diana factory was forced to abandon air gun production and instead were made to make firearms parts for the German war effort. And then following the Second World War, as part of Germany's reparations and limitations on their arms manufacturer, the Diana trademark, along with the tools, machinery and plans, were all sold off and it was bought by uh, Milbro in Scotland. Then in 1950, when the sanctions were lifted, Meyer and Grammelschbacher began making air guns again. However, they'd lost the Diana trademark. However, there were still Diana named guns being made by Milbro. So these new German guns were called Original. So you could either buy the new Milbro of Diana Model 50, or Model 55, I think their version was called, or you could buy the original Model 50. The Diana trademark was, however, repurchased by Meyer and Grammelschbacher in 1984, so all new uh, Diana guns are made in Germany by the original company. Now, let's take a closer look at the Model 50. There you can see the original logo, along with the Mod 50 marking. Now, this is an underlever. So it's a spring piston gun. Uh, as I've already said, these were uh, German guns. You can see they're made in Germany on the side. Uh, these were made from the 50s up until the 80s under both the original and Diana names. Uh, this particular one is dated October 1967. You can tell that from the 1067 marking on the side. Now, this rifle is in 2.2 calibre. Uh, I believe you could also get a 177 version, but you tend to mostly see them in 2.2, or at least that's my experience. Uh, but maybe some of you out there have seen or own these in 177 versions. Now I've moved the camera back so that you can see the entire gun. Because uh, one of the first things you notice about this rifle, and what drew me to it in the first place, was the length of the stock. Now it's not quite a full length Manlika style stock, but it's longer than your average stock, which gives it that kind of military look that I quite like. And a benefit of that longer length being that actually the underlever is almost completely hidden within the stock. The stock looks like it's been refinished at some point, uh, but thankfully it's been done quite well. And it still retains the original butt pad. Now I guess it's a right-handed rifle, as uh, it's got a raised Monte Carlo cheek piece. But it's not too prominent, so I don't think a lefty would have too many problems using this gun. It's got some checkering on the pistol grip. Well, I think that's for look as much as anything else. It's very shallow and it doesn't aid grip at all. And all the metal parts are all glued steel. Uh, there's very little plastic on it, just a tiny bit on the rear sight. And a particular note, I really like this cover plate here uh, between the compression chamber and the barrel. Uh, it's not really needed, it's not essential, but it's very aesthetically pleasing. I think it helps add to that kind of military style look. Now it's quite a long gun. Uh, coming in at about three and three quarter feet, including a 17 or 18 inch barrel, depending on exactly where the barrel starts in here. And it's also quite a heavy gun. Now I'm not sure of the exact weight, as I haven't weighed it, but I've had a look in the uh, blue book here. And that gives the weights for the different variations of it, and they go up to nine or ten pounds. As I've already said, this is an underlever. Uh, so to release a lever you push this button in at the end there and the lever drops down. Now in order for the lever to be concealed within the stock it has to be quite short, you can see there. 
and that does mean it takes quite a lot of force to cock it but I'd rather it that way than have a kind of a full length lever that clips in under the muzzle as I think this looks a lot neater now it's a tap loader so once it's cocked to load it you flick the tap forward on the top drop the pellet in tip first and then close the tap back up and it's little things like this loading tap that make this gun feel uh, very well made and good quality if you compare that to the loading tap on my Sussex Armoury Jackal it's just a very basic operation, a uh, plastic lever nothing special about that whereas compared to the, the Model 50 it's a nice metal lever, it's very smooth and you might be able to hear it clicking as it opens and closes and that's because the uh, lever runs against a spring-loaded ball bearing to allow it to clip into place when it's open and closed. It's got quite a nice trigger on it. Uh, both the trigger and the guard are both made of metal and feel sturdy. It's a three-ball trigger, which is two-stage, you can see there. And it's adjustable, you can see those two small adjustment screws there. Although the Model 50 doesn't have a safety of any kind. Now, in terms of sights, um, the rear sight here, uh, it really does look and feel well made, uh, despite having bits of plastic on it. It's adjustable for windage and elevation. Uh, it is removable, although I've never taken it off as I've never mounted a scope on this gun, but I think you would probably need to take it off to fit a scope on. And the front sight is a globe style sight with interchangeable elements. I turn it upside down there you can see that I've just got a simple post in it and the front sight is also removable it's just screw clamped into a dovetail in the barrel there and now I like the open sights and they work quite well although if I'm honest I'd probably rather have just a more standard fixed post front sight but that's just my preference uh, it does have the facility to mount a scope uh, it hasn't got like a standard dovetail or um, weaver rails or anything, instead it's got this kind of raised block to clamp a scope to. Now I'm going to test the accuracy and that will be using the open sights as because I've already said I haven't uh, ever mounted a scope on it so I'm not going to start now just for the video. I'm going to take 10 shots at one of these standard targets at a distance of around 12 and a half meters and I'll be using these 13.5 grain Bisley Wasp number 2 pellets. Now I know these aren't the best pellets but I'm a little low on 2.2s at the moment and I found that these ones do seem to work quite well in this gun. Here you can see I have that target. Now I don't think that's too bad for open sights. Um, you can discount this one up here as that was my last shot and I did feel myself pull the gun slightly as I squeeze the trigger. Uh, still two or three strays but I don't think you'd probably get those if you were a better shooter or if you had a scope mounted which would obviously improve the accuracy. Uh, most of them though a uh, tight enough group for me to be happy with. Now in terms of power uh, if you saw the air armory video on the Firebird exploding targets. Um, you'll remember that this gun didn't set it off. I think that's because it wasn't powerful enough. And if you're interested in that video, I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, since then, I've run it over the chronograph and I got a power of just 3.38 foot pounds. So it was a little tired to say the least. Uh, but following that poor test, I stripped it down, and replaced the mainspring. I put one of these Titan XS mainsprings in. This one's a number one, but it's got a number three in it. And I also replaced the leather piston seal, as it looked quite worn as well. Now I'm going to put ten pellets over the chronograph to see what power it's getting now. And for that I'll again be using the wasp number two pellets. So here I have my test sheet, 
Uh, now I've already done my sums, so I can tell you that it's now recording at a power of 6.7 foot-pounds with a spread of 43.6 feet per second. Now I know that's essentially doubled the power that it was before, but 6.7 foot-pounds still seems to be pretty low. Uh, I don't know what power these were supposed to put out when they were new, but I thought a new spring and seal would get it up to at least 8 or 9 foot-pounds. Um, for my purposes I don't need it to be too powerful, but if anyone does have any ideas why it's still so low, please let me know in the comments below. Um, as I've mentioned, I took this gun apart to change the spring. Um, now I'm not sure if any of you own one of these rifles and have stripped it down, but they're absolute murder to put back together, especially with that three ball trigger and a new mainspring. Uh, but luckily I had a parts diagram and a good guide that I found online to help me. Uh, for that reason I'm obviously not going to take it apart now. I will just take the stock and end cap off just so you can see how complex it looks inside the compression chamber. First of all, remove the spring, uh, the screw, sorry, in the trigger guard. And then the main pin through here. It's always one of these tricky ones to get off. release that cotton lever there and then the last bit I need my pliers again for again another fiddly one Nearly there. Ease that out of the stock. You can also see there that cover plate I mentioned earlier on. Let me just get the oh. cotton lever doesn't want to come out too easily so I'll leave it in there. So now we've got the cap on the end of the compression chamber. Pull that off. Move the camera up there. So that's what you've got inside it. Uh, not simple or fun to put back together. So in there you've got the main spring, you've got spring guide, um, the spring and the ball bearings for the um, three ball trigger. You've got two cross pins holding that all together and holding the trigger in. Uh, yeah, not fun to put, put back together. There you can see the rifle safely back together. Uh, I forgot to say a minute ago actually when I was talking about when I stripped it down I had the additional hassle in that when I changed the piston seal I couldn't unscrew the old screw holding the seal assembly in place uh, and that screw then broke off so I actually had to drill it out and then recut the thread for the new screw in the end of the piston. Now if you've seen many of the other Air Armoury videos you'll be aware that I'm also interested in the history of the guns and here I have quite an interesting photocopy of an old 
early 60s original catalogue and that has some information about the Model 50 which I'll just read you briefly. How to handle Model 50. The air rifle Model 50 is built with fixed barrel and cocking lever. To cock the gun hold the small of the butt in the right hand and with the left hand press down the push button protruding at the fore end of the stock thereby releasing the cocking lever which latter must be slowly pressed downwards until the trigger engages with an audible click. Then return the cocking lever to its normal position, taking care that it is firmly secured by the push button. The cocking lever must be flush with the stock. The Model 50 has a loading hole at the top of the barrel, between the barrel and cylinder, into which pellets are dropped head first. To open and close the loading chamber, after inserting pellets, push side lever backwards and forwards. The trigger should never be touched when the rifle is cocked and cocking lever is slack. Neither should the rifle be discharged without a pellet having been inserted previously as either of these courses is injurious to the mechanism of the rifle. Each air gun is tested and sighted by experts before leaving the factory. Um, so obviously yeah, pretty standard stuff there but I think quite interesting nonetheless. Now that I've increased the power, I think it's time for round two of original Model 50 versus Firebird Exploding Target. That's one all. So there you've seen the original Model 50. Now I really like this rifle. It looks and feels really nice and it's got some interesting history behind it. Uh, it's accurate enough for what I want it for, although it still does seem to be lacking a bit of power. But at the end of the day you're probably not going to be using one of these rifles for serious hunting or entering an HFT competition with it. Um, I mean this rifle is around 45 years old now and there are many older than that. So it's becoming a bit of a collector's item, but it's still really fun to shoot and that's what's important. Now I think I mentioned earlier on that the Model 50 was only made up until the 80s, so you can't buy them new anymore, but they do seem to be readily available on the second hand market still. Uh, I paid £160 for this rifle, which seems to be about right. I think that's actually quite good value for one without a scope, uh, but like with all things, the price depends on things like condition. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Keep your arms in the air.